Did our press just break? Yup. <laughs> I love being the pastor of this church and just giving you one truthful video after the other, after the other. And did you notice when the pressure started coming on the cowboy helmet, it kind of squiggled away and ran off like a little schoolgirl that it was? You know what I'm saying? You see that? So good. I'm so glad that you're here with us today here in the room. Also, those watching us on TV and online. I'm also thankful for all of our multi-site campuses all over New Mexico and Belize. Thankful for each and every one of you. A couple of quick things I want to get into before I get into the message. One, I want to tell you how proud I am of you. Uh, we did a thing called Feed My Starving Children. I told you I needed 1,000 volunteers. For those of you who don't know what this is, we packed up these uh, little food parcels, and uh, uh, we sent them overseas to third world countries where children are starving. And so uh, they also get to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And we asked for 1,000 volunteers, which is a big ask. And once again, within a 24-hour period, over 1,000 of you signed up to be a part of Feed My Starving Children. So thank you for doing that. And then, you know, you showed up for it, which was incredible. It was a wonderful time. And now, so far, with our partnership with Feed My Starving Children, we have packed 2.1 million meals for children. Isn't that incredible? Yay, God. You know, we're able to synergize our resources to do things like this. That cost $80,000 yesterday to do that. And that's because of your tithes and your offerings and your generosity. When, when I tell you you don't have a clue how many people you're reaching, you really don't have a clue. Because those monies that you give, they don't stay here. They, they go out and they make an impact. And I, and I honestly believe there'll be a day that you'll stand before the Father and He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. I, I do, and I think He's going to say, great is your reward, and you're going to think it's going to be a mansion. And yeah, you're going to get a mansion, but that's not what He's talking about. It's the people. It's the people that you made the difference in their lives along the way. That is our reward. So way to go, Sagebrush. Thank you for your generosity week after week after week. Another thing I want to make mention of is we're having a big special celebration party called our VIP party, our very important person party. This is where we get all of our volunteers together, all of our team leads together, and we have a night of celebration as we look forward to look back at what God has done and we look forward to what God is going to do. Do. We're going to have crumble cookie and all kinds of fun things to drink. You get a special edition sagebrush t-shirt also. You can only get it if you come to the event. So we want you to register. So go to the Sagebrush app, click over on the banner, click VIP. There's places for you to register for that. We also have kid care available uh, for your children during that time. Staff has put together some fun things for that night. I've got a talk that I really want to give about the future of our church and where we're heading. So if even you've thought about volunteering or becoming a part of one of our teams and being used by God, Come on this night and hear the heartbeat uh, behind Sagebrush. So I hope you'll take the time to, to fill that out and you'll show up. All right, this is the last week of this sermon series called Pressure Point. We're at the end of our study in the book of James. And today we're going to talk about prayer. It happened in 1857. Uh, the pastors in New York City got together because they were concerned that church attendance was in a steady decline. And so they began to brainstorm things that they thought might help church attendance come back again, but they really didn't come up with anything of any substance. Well, from that meeting, a pastor got together with one of his businessmen in his church, and he said, what if we started a prayer meeting on Wednesdays at noon, and we passed out flyers and invited people to come and to pray? And the businessman thought that was a good idea. He said he would spearhead it. So they made a bunch of flyers. They passed them out. And on the first Wednesday of the prayer meeting, the guy who passed out the flyers was the only one who showed up. At 12 noon, he prayed alone, and then about 12.30, another person walked in, so he began to pray with that person as well. And by 1 o'clock, there were six people gathered together for prayer. Well, it was such a meaningful time, and it was such an impactful time. They said, let's not give up on this. Let's keep passing out flyers. So they did. 
And the next week when they met, 20 people showed up. The following week, 40 people showed up. And within a few months, they had outgrown that little small church because so many people were coming at Wednesday at noon to pray and to seek the face of God. Well, guess what? Other pastors in the area heard about this. And they said, well, if it works over there, it ought to work for us too. So they opened up their churches at 12 noon. And all of a sudden, people started going to their churches also for prayer. Prayer. Friends, this became a phenomenon. All told in 1857, it's estimated that 40,000 people started showing up on Wednesdays at noon to pray. In fact, the factories in the area blew their horns at 1155 so people could get to the prayer meeting. There was a New York reporter who was looking outside of his window about 11.50, 11.55, and he saw a strange phenomenon. He saw, he saw adults running. Adults don't run. You understand that? We walk swiftly. That's what we do. We don't run from one place to the other. He sees adults running. So he goes down. Everybody's disappearing. They're all disappearing in churches. In fact, the two newspapers during that time every week would put what the prayer gathering was, where it was going to be, what they were going to be praying for. This began to spread throughout the United States of America to other cities like Denver and Dallas and Miami from one side of the coast to the other side of the coast. And church historians say in 1859 a million unchurched people gave their lives to Jesus Christ all as a result of what started in that prayer meeting years earlier so here's my question does God still move that way today he does he does so here's the question why aren't we seeing it when we started this church 25 years ago I wanted to go back in time and I wanted to be like the very first church and if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. We'll see the power of God like the people in the book of Acts saw when we start praying like the people in the book of Acts prayed. So i got to ask you, how's your prayer life? If you're like me, it's kind of maybe spotty a little bit. You have a hard time staying focused. And you want to do better, don't you? I know you want to do better. I want to do better too. How many times have you set it as a goal? Like you said, I'm just going to put five sentences together without being distracted. I'm just going to talk to God for five sentences. And you just can't seem to pull it off. It's like the guy, he starts to pray and he says, Lord, thank you for the changing of the seasons. Thank you for the cooler temperatures. The leaves are changing and they're falling to the ground. Just the leaves are falling to the ground. You know, the other day I saw my neighbor, he was, he was raking his leaves. I think he got all that raked up, to be honest with you. In fact, I'm about down my neighborhood. I might be the last person to rake their leaves. You know, daylight savings time. Well, that's coming right around the corner. I, I, I probably need to get out there and rake my leaves. And before you know it, you're out raking the leaves. And you don't even know why you're out there raking the leaves. And you abandon prayer. Can you relate to what I'm saying? Or maybe you can relate to this woman. Take a look. Dear God, thank you for this lovely day. The coffee is steaming hot and in my favorite mug. Thank you for this beautiful book I have to read. Thank you that we have made it to 10 a.m. and I haven't had to turn on the AC. Hold on, did I pay the electric bill? I should remember if I did, I'm sure it was expensive. I am so grateful for a clean and quiet house. Wait. It's too quiet. Did Timmy start the dishwasher before school? Ooh, that boy's gonna make me lose my mind. Lord, help me to stay focused on you today. I am just so busy. Katie needs her uniform clean for soccer today. Dang grass, why can't they play on turf? My husband needs me to make his lunch again. I need to write all this down before I forget. You been there? Yeah, of course you have. You're driving down the road. You think, I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray. So you have the music on the background, right? And, and you're trying to stay focused. You're not trying to be distracted. And, and all of a sudden, you hear in the background, baby, 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 oh, like, baby, 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 oh. And you're like, that is a tune that needs to be jammed right now. 
I need to fire that puppet dog up. And before you know it, the windows are down. You're singing, baby, 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 oh, right? That's what you do. I've seen you in the sagebrush stickers. I've driven by you. I've seen you do it. <laughs> or you'll be in the worship service. And we're having a really solemn moment. We're partaking of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. And we know that the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. And the juice represents the, the blood of Christ that was poured out so we could have forgiveness of our sins. And the pastor says, listen, a man ought to examine himself. A woman ought to examine themselves and ask God, is there any wicked way within me? Anything not pleasing to you? And so you know this is a solemn moment. You're talking to God, but then all of a sudden you feel a hunger pain, right? And, you, and all of a sudden, your mind goes someplace else like, I wonder where we're going to eat after this. That's what I wonder. And how many times have you looked at those things and thought, that wafer is awful small. Why is it so small? That, that has no filling right there, I tell you. Why can't they make those bigger? Am I the only one that's ever had that thought? Is that what you were doing? Sometimes, you know, you'll be sitting in service, and you're, you've already drifted in and drifted out during this time, haven't you? That's what you've done. You've already drifted in and drifted out on me. Because some of you women have looked over at your husband and said, oh, my goodness, he does have a double chin. That's what you did. That's what you did. James, who wrote this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did you know his nickname was Camel Knees? And the reason his nickname was Camel Knees because he had so many calluses on his knees from praying. He even had, the historians tell us, he had divots in the wood by his bed from where he would kneel down and he would spend hours seeking God. Friends, I don't think we'd ever be distracted in our prayers ever again if we fully understood who we were talking to and what he was capable of doing. And I think if James was here today, he would shout out and say the same things that God did in the past are the same things that God wants to do in and through our lives today. And so he gives us this invitation to pray. And then he tells us three different occasions that we should be praying. And then he gives us a little insight on how to have more power in our prayers. Let's look at the occasions first. First he says, pray if you are in trouble. He writes, if any of you, is any of you in trouble, he should pray. Now, most of us don't have a problem with this one. When you find yourself in trouble, when you find yourself in the midst of a problem, eventually, right, we get around to lifting that up to the Lord. It might not be our first thought, but it eventually comes and, we, and we'll seek God. And you're going to have lots of opportunities this next week to pray because you're going to have problems come up. You're going to have trouble that comes your way. Let, let me talk to the students here, the college students, the high school, mid-school students. There's probably going to be a time this next week when one of your teachers is going to walk in with a smile on their face, and they're going to say, pop quiz. Now, that is an opportunity for prayer. And this is what I would pray. Lord, if you're ever going to come back, come back right now. I need you right now because <laughs> I got to get out of this pop quiz because I'm not prepared for it, right? Some of us are going to have doctor's appointments this next week, and they're going to run scenarios. And they're going to run tests. And the C word might even pop up in the conversation. And I promise you if it does, you'll immediately lift up a prayer. Oh God, don't let this be cancer. Some of us are going to get a text message or an email from your boss. And he's going to want to see you at the end of the day. And you don't know why he wants to because he never does that. And immediately in that moment, you're going to say a quick prayer. God, let my job let my job be secure. Every time we have a problem, every time trouble comes our way, it's an opportunity to enter into the throne room of God and lay our burden, lay our request before him. And again, this is what the church in Acts did, right? They had all kinds of problems. They had all kinds of trouble. I mean, first off, Jesus comes to the disciples and he ascends before them to the right hand of the Father. And before he goes, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this is a big task, a big assignment that Jesus has left them. They are to spread the message of Jesus to the ends of the world. Do you realize how in over their head they were? And so what did they do? The Bible says they gathered together in the upper room and they prayed. Now, you do understand that great commission of going into the world and spraying the message of Jesus wasn't just for them, but it's for us too. And that the task we have before us is so great and so overwhelming that it should drive us to our knees as we pray for our world that we live in today. When Peter and John were thrown in jail for an act of kindness to a crippled person, 
when they were thrown in jail, the early church got together in their homes and they prayed for their release. And when they were released, do you know what they prayed for? They didn't pray for comfort. They didn't pray that they would never be thrown in jail again. They didn't pray that persecution would never come their way. You know what they prayed for? They prayed for boldness. They prayed for courage. They prayed that they would be strong enough to continue to spread the message of Jesus no matter what might come their way. In the book of Acts, it talks about that they gathered together in the temple courts for their corporate worship. That's what we're doing today. And then they would meet in homes, in small groups, and they would pray. I've often wondered if the people in the book of Acts, when they got in their homes and they prayed, if their prayers sound similar to the small group prayers that we have in homes across Albuquerque and New Mexico. I I have a feeling that their prayers were a little more intense. Do you know why I think that? Because there was persecution outside their doors. There was a loss of their livelihood, a loss of their jobs, a loss of their freedom, maybe even a loss of their life. I think the people in the book of Acts prayed as if their life depended upon it because it actually did. So when trouble comes your way, who do you turn to first? You still turn into yourself? Well, I got in this mess, I'll get myself out of it. Are you getting comfort in that as you take that burden on your own? Do you turn to a friend? Do you turn to a family member? Nothing wrong with that. We need other people to carry our burdens with us. But the first person we should turn to is God Almighty because he's the only one that can do something about the situation that we find ourselves in. There's no need that you have that's too great for him. There's no burden that he can't lift off your shoulders. And there's no temptation that you're going to face this next week that he won't provide a way out. So we pray through our problems. We pray when we're in trouble. And he says this, pray when life is good. He says, anyone happy, let him sing songs of praise. I don't know if you know this or not, but when we come here together and we sing songs, it's more than just singing songs. Some of you think these are just songs. They're not songs. They're prayers. They're worship prayers to God. And, and, I, and I want you to get this. Worship is a weapon. How many times have you come in here and you've been so overwhelmed and you've been so burdened and life has not turned out the way you hoped that it would and then you get your focus and you fix your attention upon Jesus and what happens? The depression begins to wane because worship is a weapon. The discouragement begins to wane because worship is a weapon. The problems that you came in with were so big and so great and so overwhelming. They begin to get perspective as you look at how big and great and awesome our God is. So we come in here, we're to lift up our voices, we're to lift him up on high because we need it so much. We lift our prayers up to the heavens. And the Bible says that we're to make a joyful noise unto him. And and I know for some of you, you don't sing very loud because that's all you can do is you make a joyful noise. I mean, you you can't carry a tune to save your life, man. Sounds like you just rock and rolled over a cat. You know what I'm saying? When you start singing, it's a nightmare right there. But it doesn't matter, does it? Because the Bible says that he gave you that voice and he gave you that voice to praise his name. I remember years ago, I was at LBJ Middle School. We just started this church. We were about two and a half years old. I was on the front row. I was getting ready to go up on the platform to speak. And we were singing our prayers to the Lord. Because that's what our songs are. They're prayers to God. And, And so there was a guy, one row behind me. And he had the worst voice I have ever heard in my life. And he was singing at the top of his lungs. I mean, he was in it to win it. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, was, he sang so loud and so off key, he got me off key. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I thought the guy was injured or someone was injuring him. I wasn't sure what was going on. So I said, I've got to see this for myself. Who is this cray-cray making this kind of cray-cray noise? That's what I thought. So I turned around and I glanced to see who it was. And that's when I was humbled. There was this man with his hands to the heavens and his eyes were closed and tears were pouring down from his cheek as he was singing to his Lord and Savior with every fiber of his being. And I just thought to myself, he gets this on a much deeper level than I get this. It's as if he was saying, nobody's taking my place. 
Nobody's taken my place in giving praise and honor and glory to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. He's been so good to me. And so I'm going to sing my love songs back to him. Friends, listen to me. we got to do better around here. And I don't know why I've put off so long to tell you about this, but, you know, the first five, six rows, man, you guys are singers, man. You worship the Lord. You are in it. It's on like Donkey Kong for you folks, right? <laughs> but we start getting ourselves back just a little bit farther and some of you, you're doing your best Millie Vanilli impersonation. <laughs> you're, you're just missing it. You're coming in here with all these burdens, and you're leaving with them too. And you don't feel refreshed. You don't get a new perspective of what God can do and what God can accomplish because you're so concerned with what somebody else thinks of your voice. What do you care? What do you care what anybody else says or anybody else thinks? We live our life for an audience of one. And if that's the voice he gave you, you use that voice to praise his name and lift him up on high. And together, friends, we'll make a beautiful noise. Together, we'll make a beautiful noise. So when we're, life is good, what do we do? We sing songs of praise to him. And then he says this, we should pray when we're sick. Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Now, there was a study that was done a few years ago amongst 400 heart attack patients at the University of California. You can look it up if you like. Here's what they did. They took 200 patients... And they prayed for them. They had prayer groups pray for 200 of them. And then the other 200, no one prayed for them. Now, both of them got the same medical attention. But the, the doctors didn't know who was being prayed for and who wasn't. And the nurses didn't know who was being prayed for and who wasn't. The patients themselves didn't know if they were being prayed for or not. And the prayer group had never met the people they were praying for. They were just names on a piece of paper. They wanted to see if prayer would make a difference between the two groups. Here's what they found in the study. The group that was prayed for were less likely to develop congestive heart failure or to require antibiotics or breathing tubes. Fewer developed pneumonia or experienced cardiac arrest than the group that was not prayed for. Now, we're not surprised by that, are we? Because there's power in our prayers, and we've all experienced it. Every one of us have prayed for something, and sometimes God instantaneously answers the prayer, and we're always blown away, like, that just happened. God just did that. We've all seen it. We've all witnessed it. Now, does this mean that we shouldn't seek medical attention when we find ourselves sick? Absolutely not. That's not what James is saying. He's saying they should be anointed with oil, and then spiritual people need to pray for their healing. Now, oil in the New Testament was the best medicinal purposes they had. That was the best medicine that they had. So you understand what James is saying? You get the best doctors, you get the best medicine that you can, and you get the best people, the most spiritual, the people who are closest to God, praying for you. And somewhere between those two things, God will hear those prayers, and God will intervene in that situation. Now, I need that right now, desperately. I need your prayers. Let me tell you what's going on with me. Last Saturday night, I was washing dishes in the kitchen, which is a lesson to all the men that washing dishes is extremely dangerous and hazardous to your health, and only trained professionals should wash dishes. So you should step away from the sink. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So I'm washing the dishes, and all of a sudden, my left ear clogs up. Now, I've had a clogged ear before. It's not a big deal. So I yawned to try to unclog it. wouldn't unclog. So I blew my nose, and it wouldn't unclog. I took water, held my nose, wouldn't unclog. I did all the things on the Internet you're supposed to do to unclog your ear, and none of the things would work. And I thought, this is the craziest thing. So I thought, well, maybe there's some fluid backed up. I'll just get a heating pad. I'll go to bed, and I'll lay on the heating pad, and uh, my hearing will return in the morning. Well, the next morning, I woke up and couldn't hear very much out of that ear. 
So I called a friend of mine who was my primary care doctor, and he said, let's get you in early Monday morning. So I went in, and I got my ear looked at, and he said, well, I, I don't know, but we'll put you on a steroid, and we'll get you with an ENT and have them check you out and see what's going on. In the meantime, I want you to go to this audiologist, and I want you to get your hearing checked. So that afternoon, I went to an audiologist, I did all the hearing tests, and I found out that I had lost 45% of my hearing in this ear. Well, the next morning, when I woke up on Tuesday morning, I'd lost it all. I'm completely deaf in my left ear. And of course, the fear that hit me immediately is, is this going to go over to my right ear as well? And so I started getting vertigo and dizzy. And oh my goodness, I've thrown up so many times this week, I'm so sick of throwing up. And I just prayed and prayed and prayed that I would have the strength and the ability to come and give this message because this message means so much to me, and I think it will mean a lot to you about prayer, and, and God's given me the strength, but I still can't hear a, a doggone thing. Now listen, I know that what I'm facing right now pales in comparison to what many of you are facing right now. My, my goodness, your, your issue isn't hearing loss in one ear. Your issue is much greater. Your issue is more life and death. Everything in your world is falling down around you. And so I want you to know that I pray for you, and I want you to pray for me. That's why we need the church, to lift each other up, to cast our cares upon each other so we can go to the Father together and intercede on behalf of each other. Now, now here's what's interesting. Wouldn't this be wonderful if this was the secret formula to being healed every time? I mean, you get the best medical people involved, and then you get the best people praying for you, and then all of a sudden, everything just turns out perfect. But, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way, does it? You see, I'm very much prepared for God to say no. I mean, if I don't get my hearing back, blessed be his name. If, if the only thing that he ever gave me was salvation, he's been better to me than I've ever deserved. And so whether he gives it back to me, blessed be his name. Doesn't give it back to me, blessed be his name. I will praise him, and I know that he is with me. I have learned so many things this past week about the presence of God and the power of God and about the power of prayer. I'm closer to God today than I was a week ago because of what I'm walking through right now. And isn't that the way it works? There are some storms in life that that's where you learn really the life lessons, isn't it? That's where you learn the tough stuff. And then you find out if your faith is strong enough to persevere. If you have that defiant faith that says, naked I came in this world and naked I'll leave it. Blessed be the name of the Lord no matter what. No matter what. I understand that there's a difference between being cured and being healed. Do you understand the difference? There was a woman in the foyer, and she went to one of our pastors, and she was sharing with them with her husband. Her husband was ate up with cancer, and she asked for prayer, and so the pastor laid hands upon the person, and uh, three days later, he didn't think anything more about it, so he got a phone call in his office, and the woman called, and she said, Pastor, you prayed for me and my husband. He had cancer. Do you remember that? And the pastor was excited because he thought this is a great update. He probably was healed. She said, He died. He said, I'm so sorry. She said, Pastor, when I brought him to church this past Sunday, he was so ate up with anger and bitterness. He was 58 years old. 58 years old. He wanted to see his grandkids grow up. He wanted to watch his kids flourish. And he felt robbed. He felt cheated from God. So he was angry and he was bitter towards God. And he was miserable to be around. But then you prayed for him. And a peace came over him. In these last three days, they've been like heaven on earth. We've read scripture together. We've prayed together. We've worshiped God together. And then she said this, God didn't cure him, but God healed him. Our bodies are breaking down. And in an instant, you can lose something that was so precious to you. We're getting a new body. 
A body that's going to be painless and powerful. I mean, do you want to keep your old body? Look at you. Look in the mirror. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you want to keep that old thing? You don't want to keep that old thing. No, you do not want to keep that. You want that new body. And one day he will bless you with that. You will be healed. You're going to a place where there is no more sickness. There is no more suffering. There is no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. For behold, our God has made everything new again. Now, James tells us if we want power in our prayers, because you can have more power in your prayers, he gives us some secrets to this. First thing is this. He says we need to pray with faith. We need to pray with faith. I think he remembered the words of Jesus, Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, it will be done for you. I I think some of us are guilty of faithless prayers. You know, you pray a prayer, and as soon as you say amen, you think, oh, that's not going to happen. And, and I've done that this past week, I'll be honest with you, because I've prayed for the hearing to return so many times, and every time I get done, now I'm getting to the place like, ah, still there, still can't hear a thing. And I just think you need to be honest with God about it. God, help me with my doubt. Help me with my unbelief. I'm scared. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm not certain. I'm not certain that you're going to do this for me. I really need you to be honest with him. But how many times have you prayed a faithless prayer and then God shows up and does something miraculous and it just absolutely blows you away? There was a pastor who went and visited this uh, person in his church. They They were in the hospital and she had been there for a couple of weeks and she had lost all feeling in her legs. And so he went there, had a nice conversation with her, and then at the end he he had a word of prayer with her, and he prayed for healing, that God would restore the power in her legs. He said, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the woman opened her eyes and she said, Pastor, as you were praying, I felt like power was surging through my legs, and I believe that God has healed me, and I'm going to get out of this bed and show you. He said, no, you're not. You stay in that bed right now. She said, no, no, no. He said, let me at least get a nurse to assist you. She said, I'm not waiting for some nurse. And she ripped off the covers, jumped out of the bed, starts walking around. Then she's jumping and dancing. She's going crazy. Pastor is freaked out. You understand? He goes back to his car to say another prayer. He says, Lord, don't ever do that to me again. I'll tell you that right now. Here's the question. You pray with all the faith that you've got, and you still don't get what you want. Is that on you? Man, I've heard people say terrible things to people. And the reason they have cancer is because they don't have enough faith. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Don't you ever listen to that kind of garbage. Are you telling me the apostle Paul didn't have enough faith when he prayed three times for that thorn in his side to be removed, and God said No. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, then that's when God is strong in your life. Do you think Jesus didn't have enough faith? Praying in the Garden of Gethsemane so intensely, sweat drops of blood are pouring down from his brow. He says, if there's any other way to save mankind from their sins, let's go another way. And God said, no, you're going to the cross. You're going to be the ultimate Lamb of God to die for our sins. No, we pray with all the faith that we've got, but we also trust in the sovereignty of God. That he's doing things behind the scenes and he's working things in and through us that we're not even aware of to mold us and shape us to be the person that he needs us to be. So we hold on to him with white knuckle intensity and we just won't let go of him. So we pray with faith. And then second thing is this, if you want more power in your prayers, you need to have a right relationship with others. Look at these verses, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. Matthew 5, 23. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. How about 1 Peter 3, 7? In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, speaking of physically, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. If you don't treat her as you should, look at this, your prayers will not be heard. Okay, here's the deal. You hold a grudge against somebody else. You have unforgiveness towards somebody else. God says, don't expect me to listen to you. Because God finds that ridiculous. Here he offers his grace, his forgiveness to you, and you take it, don't you? But then you don't extend it to other people. 
and then you wonder why your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling back at your head again, if you have unforgiveness, if you have bitterness, if you have someone that you hate, you better work it out with them. And the Bible says you do it as much as it depends upon you. I know there are some people that don't want peace. I know there's some people that want to hold a grudge. You can't worry about that. You do everything you can to make it right. And if you'll do that, your prayers, he'll listen to your prayers. You can add power to your prayer. Let me give you the third one. You got to be righteous. Does that mean we got to be perfect? (laughs) No. It means you're going to be in a right relationship with God. Here's the bottom line. People who are the closest to God have the most effective prayers. So you're as close to God today as you've chosen to be. So that's how effective your prayers are. How close do you want to be to God? And he gives us the example of a man named Elijah. And he says, Elijah was a man just like us. And if you know the story of Elijah, you know that's true. Uh, Elijah was depressed. He was suicidal. He was fearful. He was just like us. Same issues as us. He was a prophet. During the time when the children of Israel had turned their backs upon the Lord. And so he prayed for them to repent of their sin. But they refused. So he prayed for a natural disaster to come upon the people. So that that would break them. Look at what he says here. He prayed earnestly. Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed. And the heavens gave rain. And the earth produced its crops. So what does this mean? Well, God's impressed with the person who believes that God could do incredible things. Write this down. If your prayers aren't impossible to you, they're insulting to God. My goodness, he's the one who created the heavens and the earth and every universe and every galaxy. You think there's anything impossible with him? He's the one who parted the Red Sea. He's the one who shut the mouths of the lions. There's nothing, absolutely nothing he can't do. And maybe today you're bored with your prayer life because you're praying for things that you could answer yourself. Pray a big, hairy, audacious prayer. You see the empty seats around you? Why don't you pray that God would use you to plunder hell and populate heaven? You think about orphans in our town? Maybe God would raise up a spirit where where people would say, I want to adopt a child, and I want to clear out all the orphanages in town. You ever think about the human trafficking that's happening all around the world? Do you ever pray for God to intervene in that situation? Does it even enter your mind? Are you praying anything bigger than your own little small concentric circle of comfort? Do you pray for our city? Do you pray for our state? Do you pray for the government officials? Do you pray for the United States of America? Oh, I know you watch the news. I know you read it on the internet. And I know you roll your eyes at it. And you're disgusted about it just as much as I am. But are you asking God to intercede? Are you asking God to turn the hearts of the people here in the United States of America back to him? That he would break us so we would seek his face? We pray small, safe prayers and then we wonder why we're overwhelmed with stress and discouragement he's a big god and there's nothing that he can't do so call upon his name and pray a big hairy audacious prayer i'm going to share one more thing with you every thursday at 11 o'clock in room 112 right over here we meet for prayer And every time you put a prayer request in the prayer wall, we pray for that. Every time you use the Sagebrush app and you put a prayer request in, we pray for every single request. You shouldn't face any burden alone. I don't want to face what I'm facing alone. I don't want you to face what you're facing alone. Let's be people of prayer. Let's pray every single day as if our life depends upon it. Because it actually does. Let's talk to him now. Dear Heavenly Father... We need you. We need your intervention. There are so many things in our life that are beyond our control, but they're not beyond yours. Lord, I know some of us are discouraged because we've prayed and prayed and prayed, and we have not received the answer that we hoped for. Lord, I pray that we would trust you in the midst of it, that no matter what, blessed be your name. Lord, this next week when we have opportunities to pray for other people, when we see needs, I pray we would do it right in that moment, that we would pray for you to intervene. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.